a lot. How many people know the word hyperparameters and do hyperparameters? OK, how many people do hyperparameter optimization in a production machine learning pipeline? OK, a, little, okay, a couple people. All right, so what, I, what I've noticed with machine learning is um, when I learned about hyperparameter optimization for the first time, there are lots of really abstract concepts in machine learning. Hyperparameter optimization is one of them. And they make machine learning a very confusing and intimidating field for newcomers. And I was certainly very confused and intimidated when I first approached the field of machine learning and got further into it and came across some of these more complicated topics. But luckily for us, this represents an amazing opportunity in visualization to help convey some of these incredibly abstract ideas. And so my name is Alexandra. I'm a software engineer at SIGOPT. We provide an API for Bayesian parameter optimization. And I really enjoy talking about hyperparameter optimization and kind of sharing with people what I've learned over the last year when it comes to understanding, implementing, and evaluating hyperparameter optimization. And what I'd like to show you guys today is some of the illustrations that we use to kind of visualize these abstract ideas for um, people who use SIGOPT and hopefully inspire some of you to um, look more into doing work in visualizing abstract concepts in machine learning. So machine learning is built off of a couple basic problems that should be pretty familiar from stats. I've seen versions of the IRIS data set up um, on the screen at various points during the day. Essentially what we're trying to do is classification or regression, you know, predicting labels or predicting numbers. Um, so the IRIS data set is petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width, and we're trying to predict the species of the iris. Um, with the advent of technologies like deep neural nets, we can go from a picture of an iris to the species of an iris. Regression problems are things like given a million users and a million movies and a billion ratings, try to predict the rating that a user will give to a movie they have never seen. And there's a couple key terms that are really important to this process. Um, what we're doing is where, and these should be familiar from statistics, is we have examples of correct and um, correct pieces of data, where correctly labeled data, correctly classified data. And this is our training data. And we'll feed our training data into a machine learning algorithm or machine learning model. And we hope that by feeding in more training data, our model will become better at performing its task. Our machine learning model, as we train it, will become more accurate, better at predicting a label, better at predicting a number, and less prone to error. This problem can be very intimidating for newcomers because it is surprisingly easy to set up your machine learning models incorrectly. I was also speaking to someone earlier today about reproducibility of results. And in the scientific community, when it comes to reproducibility of results, he referred to something known as kind of a lucky split of your data, where you happen to pick the right values for your hyperparameters that give you a really good result. But this is not necessarily a reproducible and generalizable result. It's kind of just chancing on one value, and then you say, OK, I'm done. I'll stop here. Um, and what we see here is we have this um, in-browser uh, neural net from playground.tensorflow.org. It's pretty cool. And it's got um, a lot of different setup steps involved. And each setup step is a hyperparameter. And so all these things, learning rate, ratio of training to test data, the number of hidden layers in your deep neural net, the number of neurons per hidden layer, these are all hyperparameters. You have to decide values for all of these hyperparameters before you press the button to train your model. And your choice of values for these hyperparameters will be critical to whether or not this model can actually perform its task correctly. And the solution to some of these problems of um, kind of the intimidatingness of hyperparameters is automatic hyperparameter optimization. And that's what I'll be going into more, is the process by which we kind of algorithmically attempt to find 
better values for our hyperparameters. And I'll kind of be capping off with some Red, this is actually this is a pretty short talk because we're close to the end of the day and um, I don't want to ta um, take up too much of your time, but we'll be going over some relatively simple visualizations that kind of help convey some of these more complicated ideas. Um, and so the first thing we kind of want to get people to understand with hyperparameter optimization is that they may not want to do 20-dimensional math in their head. Deep Neural Net back there had 20 or more setup steps when it came to the hidden layers, ratio of training data to test data, the architecture of the Deep Neural Net. So we're all choices, and the, all those choices interact together to determine the performance of a machine learning model. Um, and this is something that's a little bit hard to understand when someone just tells it to you, so I want to show it to people. So us being the lovely community of scientists and engineers that we are, we literally just graphed machine learning model performance versus hyperparameter value. And this is not very compelling or exciting for anyone. Um, it's kind of gray. And it also does not do a very good job of capturing the interactions that we have in a larger dimensional space. Um, that's why we love Plotly, um, as Plotly allowed us to create three-dimensional graphs. And one thing that's really fun about these is, like, I love, love spinning these graphs. Um, I love creating movies of them. It's pretty fun. Um, but this does a much better job of capturing um, the interactions of your data. And something I find uh, very interesting is that the, this graph can capture um, four dimensions, uh, x, y, z axis, and color scale. Most people prefer looking at it to look at only three dimensions at once. They have the z-axis match the color scale. And it's because it's really hard for us to understand even four-dimensional math just by just looking at it. Um, and so it makes you think, well, if there are these interactions in this, in this space and I'm only seeing a tiny slice of the space of possible hyperparameter interactions, maybe this isn't something that I want to do manually. Maybe this is something I want to leave to an algorithm. So then the next thing we do is we use GIFs. It's not just, it's not just millennials on Tumblr who like GIFs. Occasionally people at machine learning companies enjoy them during tech talks. Um, and so these are really to kind of illustrate the difference between hyperparameter optimization strategies. So when you're performing hyperparameter optimization, there are different ways of doing it. And so how we try to illustrate this is um, we've got this little kind of like mountain with a couple sub peaks, it's color coded, it's got a valley, and the yellow dots are showing how the hyperparameter optimization strategies are searching through the space. On the left, we've got this strategy, it's kind of just plodding along, it doesn't get very far, and that's grid search. In the middle, we've got a strategy that's kind of trying things everywhere and doesn't seem to get to the highest point. That's random search. You're literally just picking random points in the space. It actually has been shown to perform pretty, like, fairly well. And then on the right, we've got a method that manages to kind of intelligently climb the mountain, and that's Bayesian optimization. And now, once people have seen the different hyperparameter optimization strategies, you may have one that you're interested in trying out. One thing that's great about using these optimization strategies for machine learning models is that if you're unsure which strategy you want to use, you can evaluate them against each other. Evaluating hyperparameter optimization strategies involves training your machine learning model over and over and over again, and it's very far removed from the actual data that you're dealing with. And so we actually had a very hard time kind of conveying this across to people until we said, well, the key concept of evaluating hyperparameter optimization strategies is that your model will achieve a different maximum performance when you evaluate, when you optimize your model with one experiment versus another experiment. You so you need to consider looking at a distribution of hyperparameter optimization experiments, optimizing the hyperparameters of your model, not just one time, but 50 times over. And so instead of just telling this to people, we decided to just use a histogram. And 
this kind of helps convey to people that hyperparameter optimization might be this really um, abstract concept, but actually, like, you really just should be looking at a distribution of the different values that you achieve from different hyperparameter optimization experiments, and putting them all together, you can get a really good picture of how different strategies are performing against each other. So if you're interested in doing this on your own, what you would do is run 50 optimization experiments for your model, optimize the hyperparameters 50 times, and then you can build up this histogram where you look at the maximum performance that you achieved on every optimization experiment. You draw a, line, a dash line for the mean, and you can start to get a sense of kind of the ordering of how the strategies might be performing. And then for those of you who are interested, we is not actually normal, the data isn't actually normally distributed, so we use a Mann-Whitney U test to get a sense of statistical significance um, of these results. The next thing we want to look at when we're evaluating hyperparameter optimization strategies is how much time do you have? Um, when we're training things on clusters in AWS, time really is money. And we, if we don't need to run a strategy out until the furthest time step, and we can stop early and still achieve the same results, then we're going to stop early and still achieve the same results. And so again, with this, it's not very clear when you just tell someone how two different strategies are going to line up. And so we use this kind of idea of what's the best seen value over time to show people, you know, if I stopped at time step five, I might achieve 60% accuracy with my model. If I stop at time step 10, it looks like that's about the same as time step 25. So this strategy seems to be doing pretty well because it gets a pretty good accuracy. And it also seems to be able to run in a relatively short amount of time. And again, we look at a distribution of hyperparameter optimization strategy, optimization experiments, um, to look at kind of the interquartile ranges of results. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing the 75th to 25th percentile of kind of expected performance if you were to stop your hyperparameter optimization experiment early. So for this strategy, we could probably safely stop around time step 10 instead of time step 25, and the strategy would still perform pretty well. And again, we can kind of layer these graphs together and get a better picture of how these strategies compare against each other. And we'll kind of, what we want to consider is we want to consider, you know, how, like how fast does the graph shoot up? And we can see that maybe Bayesian optimization is outperforming grid search and is outperforming random search because if you go all the way out to the end, you'll see that the values for Bayesian optimization are pretty close and slightly higher than random search and grid search, but the pink line achieves these results much faster. And so you can get faster results and um, you can get better results and you can also get them with less time. And so I said my presentation would be short. If you can take away just a couple things from what I've talked about, um, hyperparameter optimization is an invaluable part of any modern machine learning pipeline. And the ideas behind it are incredibly abstracted away from the underlying data. And so they can be a little bit difficult to understand. Visualizations really help. They're in their infancy, and I know that they're going to grow over the course of the next few years as machine learning expands. And I hope that I've given you a tiny window into this machine learning meta problem. And I can't wait to see what comes up next year. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions? I will attempt to answer as best I can, being neither an expert on optimization nor visualization. Hello. Uh, Hi. Well, thank you for your talk. It's pretty much insightful. Um, so my question is, uh, so with these sort of strategies, do you kind of implement, implement them um, simultaneously and visualize them like in real time to see the, like, how these various strategies are picking up the, uh, the parameters from the distributions? Sorry, can you repeat your question? Okay, um, so you have these 
for example, the Bayesian, the uh, degree, the random search, and then you have this uh, model, this uh, machine learning model, picking this sort of uh, values and then evaluating and seeing the, the best values it gets. Yeah. The question is this, uh, do you guys kind of update the, um, the distribution plot in real time to see how it's picking them or something? We do not visualize them in real time. But that's a good question. I have learned a lot about potential new features to build from attending PlotCon, and I hope to learn more tomorrow. Hi, I'm just curious who your audience is for these, because the people building the machine learning algorithms are presumably quite familiar with hyperparameters. Um, it seems like this is a really good way to show it to somebody who's not familiar, but they're not necessarily going to make the decision of which strategy to use? Or? So actually, it is you know, quite difficult to get across the finesses of the ideas of how to um, evaluate hyperparameter optimization strategies, even to people who build machine learning models, because um, as you can see from my show of hands, not everyone who builds machine learning models is intimately familiar with everything about hyperparameter optimization, and it's not necessarily used everywhere in practice. And so as the industry expands to accept new best practices, we have this opportunity to help shape how we disseminate information about how to kind of um, better use these complex tools. And so these, some of the um, like histogram style visualization was actually um, like developed from conversations between me and our CEO about like, can you help write a blog, like, Alexandra, can you help write a blog post that explains maybe to the bachelor's level and not the PhD level about how to evaluate hyperparameter optimization strategies? And I said, okay. And and they said, okay, but here's how you evaluate hyperparameter optimization strategies, lots of equations on the board. And I'm like, I don't get it. Can we break it down further? And that's where some of this stuff came from, is trying to explain it to someone who's less of a PhD in Bayesian optimization and more of a, like, okay, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science. I am entering machine learning for the first time. I want to know what's out there. I want to be able to quickly get up to speed with some of the latest um, best practices and techniques. Hey, um, thanks for the great talk. So another concern in machine learning, of course, is overfitting of the model. Um, so on a technical level, was there like a cross-validation scheme, like how were those experiments done? And then the second part is, how oh. do you present that to, to customers, like the, the worries about overfitting or how it performs on different cross-validations? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I actually have a tech talk on SlideShare about exactly this. Um, it's called Hyperparameter Optimization 101, and it's a very simple, just over, the first thing you should know about hyperparameter optimization is one, hyperparameter values affect your model performance, and two, overfit to, or cross-validate to avoid overfitting. Overfit to avoid cross-validation, doesn't make any sense. Cross-validate to avoid overfitting. Even if you don't know anything about machine learning models, you should cross-validate your machine learning models when you start building machine learning models. By which to say, you, you just basically shuffle your data a bunch, and when you train and tune your hyperparameters, you make sure to always shuffle your data and always get different splits of your data, and then your model will generalize better. We do, you know, we're kind of at a point where we offer a black box optimization service, and so you can use it for hyperparameter optimization, but we do not provide, say, consultancy necessarily to everyone about how they should be optimizing their hyperparameters, and we try to have a couple docs pages about, like, hey, you should be cross-validating, and we have built a feature into our API to assist people with cross-validating, but that is not something that we have a good idea of how to kind of, like, visualize at the top level, especially with such a generalizable tool. So I would love to talk to you afterwards if you have good ideas about this. All right, what else? Okay, thank you so much for having me. Yeah.